Sherry Stepakoff is a Boston area poet who can be seen performing her poems and more recently her songs at a variety of local venues. Her work has appeared in several publications and she has a blog which is titled Poetry in the Garden, Tending My World. And in the blog, Sherry shares poems from community as well as uh, what she refers to as the poetry canons. Sherry also teaches a poetry course that she developed for English as second language students in Wellesley at the Wellesley Free Library. And when I asked Sherry uh, about this experience and what it meant to her, uh, she noted that she designed the program to help students with their English while they learned a new method of self-expression. And what she noted from her experience in bringing poetry to people coming from other countries <laughs> is that it was um, an, an opportunity to learn English, but it far exceeded her expectations. And Sherry said, my students don't just learn English, they take ownership of it. And many of them have produced beautiful poems consequently. When I asked what Sherry has learned from bringing poetry making to this community, from her blog, from sharing her own poems, she said there are many things that she's learned uh, from the world of uh, art of poetry and songs. And she said, and she has also learned how much I love sharing my passion and helping people to embrace language as I do. And with that, I would like to welcome Sherry Stepakoff up here to share her poems. It's been a wonderful ride on this poetry train since that first poem for me, and um, many surprising things have come. I uh, meditate, and I often do that at uh, Wellesley College and they have that in their uh, greenhouse, which is really beautiful. And one day while I was meditating, I heard the words, here I am, and I turned it into my poem called Hineni, which is Hebrew for uh, here I am, and was spoken to God by Adam and other biblical fi figures. When the stone frog plays its watery song, when the eager daffodil trumpets the day, when the forsythia splays its joy in vibrant disarray, Hanani. When the evening air sways gently the trees, when the morning glories turn inward to pray, when the setting sun throws shadows long on paths of sepia clay, Hanani. When the nightingale cries for its mate, when the moon blanched sky has its sway, when your breath-filled name echoes with the breeze, as you search for me, I search too. Hanani, Hanani, come what may. And oh, what has come, Q614. In this very moment, at this very precise point in time, I am speaking with an angel who is also speaking with 457,459 other people. And I am astounded not by how many are speaking with my angel, but with how few. At this very precise point in time, I feel the quickening, and another and another, more joyous than the one before. And I am relieved to remember that there are as many angels as there are stars, as many as there are dreams. And I am astonished, not by how thankful I am, but by how profusely the angels are thanking me. <coughs> When my mother passed away, I wrote several poems. One of them is You Didn't Say. And I'd like to dedicate the poem reading today to all of us who have known this personal heartbreak 
and in particular to our dear friend Owen, who recently lost his mom. Many of us knew her, of course, from all the performances she attended, and we will miss her. Yellow, the color of a bright kitchen, the promise of a daffodil, the warmth of a summer sun. You didn't tell me death comes in such shades, so small and so grayed, like a wounded canary fading into dusk. You, who were the blazing yellow of a thousand suns, now stolen away. I talk to you with diminishing hope that you can still hear the love words unsung. I'm scared of what's coming, of the chasm that divides, and the chasm inside where bright used to stay. You didn't tell me of how this would feel, towering over your towering strength, now tiny and curled. You who brought me into this world, it is terribly wrong for yellow to behave in this inappropriate way since you didn't say. I still get choked up about my mom, and it's been 12 years. Uh, Victorian poet, Lord Alfred Tennyson, one of the greatest poets of all time, wrote reams of poetry in memory of his much-loved friend, Arthur Hallam, including his poem, Break, Break, Break. This poem depicts despair while looking out at the ocean, and it came back to me when I was in Florida looking at the mangrove hedges. Uh, for those not familiar, these trees um, drop their seeds into the salt water and recapture the land. The poem, The Mangrove. I'd like to tell Tennyson about the tiny stones strewn about the gnarled rocks, solidly bracing the edge of my world, where the silky waves barely lap at the shore, and nothing, nothing is breaking, at least not today. Today, the ocean twinkles my way, while the trees that it birthed form a hedge far away, and another, and another, more blue, and more green, sculpted tufts of immobile leaves. The most tenacious of these most tenacious seeds that find a home at the open sea stands at the edge a distance apart, bearing alone the wind's frequent cuts. It's a thing we've both known. There, tilted away from the throng, the lone tree grows strong and well-formed and nothing, nothing is breaking today. <clears throat> there are other things that have come too. When I was a kid, I had two goldfish named Fatty and Skinny. <laughs> this is also the name of my next poem. Fatty and Skinny shake with excitement when they see me carrying their food. I know they have keen eyes because the canister, red and yellow, fits in the palm of my hand, yet they waggle wildly and circle their bowl even when I stand some 40 feet away. They know, and I know, when the flakes go in the bowl, one, two, three, that Fatty will race to the water's edge and eat all he can while Skinny circles below. We all know Fatty, Skinny, and me, that if this goes on for too long, Skinny will die from hunger, and Fatty will explode. <laughs> Still, I can't change their fate. No matter in what remote corner of the bowl I drop a flake, Fatty wins the race <coughs> until Skinny starves, and Fatty also dies. Then into the toilet they go. Fatty and skinny are good teachers. I now eat slow and never shake and push my children out of the way to take food off their plate. <laughs> well, almost never. <laughs> and most recently, this came. 
I am a being emerging, learning, returning to a God who continually reveals what I am ready to hear. I am a human, a daughter who hears her mother and loves her, but is not her, a daughter who is not exactly Jewish. Though Moses gave the world the Ten Commandments and Abraham one creator, though Hashem, the name so holy, so unknowable, gave us the law, and the Jewish boy called Savior, Tikkun Olam, a shared responsibility to heal our world. No, I am not exactly Jewish, because with all the introspection, reflection, detection of flaws and faults for correction, I am headed in a new direction where I am loved, even when I attain less than perfection, where God is not blamed for the glitter of another tribe's sword, the God who brought it all into being with his word. I am a human, a daughter who hears her father and loves him, but is not him, a daughter who is not exactly Christian. Though to turn the other cheek, to favor the meek, to speak with as much care as we eat, are venerable teachings. Though it is a warmer comfort to rest in the breast and the arms of an in-the-flesh Lord, Though the church is always standing by, ready to welcome me, and no, I am not exactly a Christian, because I cannot relish a prediction that would end the garden where God dwells, nor receive a benediction where God, who chooses life, who sent life, who cherishes life without restriction, is blamed for planning the crucifixion. Instead of the human thirst for, the human predilection for, the man-made hell of oppressions and afflictions, that create our man-made systems of depravity infecting every part of our world. No, I am a human being, seeing beings with beards and wings weeping at the atrocities blamed on divinity, done in the name of the mystery, grieving human certainty. If it's not inclusive, it isn't love. I am a human being, honoring what each being brings to move us forward and the connection underneath when we sweep away the hubris and hold an oasis for God's love, tend the garden entrusted to us. I may be wrong, all wrong, in everything I said above, but inside, deep inside, I hear the stirring of a dove. in knowing how close. Take comfort in knowing how close you are, reeling between love and despair, open hearts ever so. Life does not wait on a foreign star. Agitated snow in a universe of persistent tar, a beloved traveler hurtling towards home's golden glow. Take comfort in knowing how close you are. In the wood, the trills and runs never far, the scent of loam, immediate and raw. No, life does not wait on a foreign star. Aware of its own unfolding within and upon, as from afar cosmic waves seek to embrace and bestow, take comfort in knowing how close you are, who we all are, to sound, to soar, to glide upon the notes of the heaven's exalted flow, life does not wait on a foreign star. So inspired, who am I, who are we, to limit God? Circles circling, there is no bar. In knowing, I make it so. Take comfort, in knowing how close you are, life does not wait on a foreign star. My next poem is very tiny, but it's shorthand for how I feel about poetry and some other things, too, that we've been discussing. No rhymes, no meter, no musicality, no peas, no person's personality, no things the thing, no alliterated attachment to antiquity, no line of liturgy, no matter, at core, 
it must be metaphor. <laughs> okay, before concluding with a few more poems, uh, I'd like to thank Cheryl again for the pleasure of being here. And I'd also like to mention, as Cheryl did, that I have a um, Poetry in the Garden Tending My World website, and there are postcards with the URL in the back. It's a sharing, a virtual sharing garden. I'm very interested in gardening as well as poetry. And um, I would welcome submissions of poems, and on there now are my poems, well, one of my poems, and um, poems from the community, poems from the canons, and, um, you can go on there and you can see some of our friends and what books they have out and that kind of thing. Okay, so, um, and you can click the follow button and you'll know when I've sent out a new poem. So I thought about um, doing several more poems to leave you with something inspiring and, and of be great beauty. And then I thought, nah. Okay, so my poem, Dandelions, um, has an epigraph from Andrew Marvel, and it's uh, from his, to his coy mistress. Marvel wrote centuries ago, and he used his exceptional poetic talents to terrorize a virgin into sleeping with him. <laughs> For most of my life, I thought him a cad. Now that I'm older, I have a slightly different response. <laughs> Marvel writes, had we but world enough in time, this coyness lady would be no crime. And now, dandelions. It starts off small, silver lines from childbirth, a nipple gone awry, then schooner sails for arms, then veins like blue roots on a road map, then a dimpled chin that quivers when you pout like an old English drama teacher who is allergic to dandelions and over emotes. For a while, you can fool yourself with hair dyes and makeup and exercise. Then the, your eyelashes fade. Then the imprints from the bed sheets stay longer on your face. And you wished you hadn't looked at your own mother that way. <laughs> and still, with it all, you don't feel old until the first time you say he's a nice young man and wish to <laughs> you had paid more attention to Andrew Marvel and had sex earlier and more often. <laughs> Here's yet another technique, the good woman. Hen, sow, cat, nanny goat, doe, mare, cow, you, lioness, roe, vain, shallow, empty, pampered, weak, callow, fickle, scattered. She who rocks the cradle must be obeyed, over emotional, underpaid, wench, bitty, cute, small, virgin, naughty, vixen, selfless, self sacrificing Amazon, spiteful, unconditional love's paragon. Heart, fickle, flighty, vengeful. Matron, pea brain, blushful. Witch, nagging, causing mankind's fall. In a marotta, chain and ball. Fox, goddess, chatty, starlet. Girl, mistress, unprincipled harlot. Tigress, temptress, distaff side. Patient, softer sex, ingenue, kind. Nun, Venus, mother, spinster, flawed. Body, haughty, frigid, broad. Swan, seductress, invisible helpmate. Doll, courtesan, knee weakener, cheap date, man eater, childish, sneaky, dumb blonde, job stealer, rolling pin wheeler, fawn, battle axe, nymph, gossip, old maid. What time can I pick you up for our date? <laughs> <laughs> and um, actually, I would like to leave something of inspiration <laughs> um, for my final poem. And I ask why I so quickly volunteer. No decide on my own to dive off the wave when the sky is so blue and the few clouds that hang there are imbued with light when the leaves in the treetops quiver with the embrace of the wind. But I do, we do, frequently, no matter how hard we try. Perhaps this is why they call us children of God. Today I watched and forgave and I didn't miss it when the day lily bloomed. Thank you for listening. Agnes, Lady Agnes Surridge Franklin, the fisherman's daughter of Marblehead, strong, tough, clever, bold. Male poets lusted after her in rhyme, alluring bosom, 
the dark eyes and hair. Sings like a bird, they said. Sir Harry, Bengal born to West India Company traders, seduced her, a child of 14. She bore and hid her secret love child, Henry Cromwell. Marblehead fishermen and sailors taunted her. All Boston called her. Yet she transformed from chambermaid to lady, changing her speak like Eliza Doolittle, her walk, her manners, from scrubbing the floors to dancing on them. She did fit in, but still they mocked her. Sir Harry built a love nest here in Hopkinton, English manor house, horses, slaves, gardens with fruit trees, lilacs, fox hunts, wassail parties, midnight revels, far from Boston's censorious eyes and tongues. Here, Henry Cromwell romped with her sister's children, fishing, hunting, whooped like savages in woods and streams. But duty called from England. Harry and Agnes sailed to London court, their son at sea with the Royal Navy in England. Harry's family shunned Agnes coldly. They fled to Lisbon, city of licentiousness and wealth, to help their social standing in a tiny chapel. Agnes and Harry wed above the doorway, carved in Latin, our vows performed, we go in peace. November 1st, 1755, All Souls Day, an earthquake shook Lisbon, but Agnes and Harry survived, along with many myths about them. Sir Harry and Lady Franklin, respectable at last, sailed back to Boston. Ill health forced Harry to Lisbon as ambassador, then retired to England where he died. Widow Franklin, and her admiral's son returned to Boston and Hopkinton until the revolution forced flight for England. Does Agnes' ghost haunt Franklin's manor still? Remembering this oft-told tale of a strong, brave woman, especially in the spring when the fruit trees and lilacs bloom. Without Agnes, Sir Harry and all his kin would be but a footnote in the annals of history. Oh, what a lovely dance it is, the advance and retreat of the tide of time, uncurling, unfurling buds of leaves, then painting them bright, red, orange and gold with cold fingers, whatever lingers. Then white whirls bleach the brown, pristining the town and the countryside until the tide of time grays down the crust remaining. Dancing in and dancing out, hours accordion, shaping the light day and night over and over again. The merry-go-round goes round and the sound of the wind and the sound of the rain beat time and again, repeating the long refrain of warm to cold and light to dark, brightening sun to glowing sparks in the sky as stars revolve. The roundelay dance of time circles us in and circles us out as we with the seasons sing our songs, joining our voices to make a chorus of all the singers from now and then, as time swirls round and back again with the swirl and the swoop of stars. <laughs> Starlight dimmed, Moonlight brightest and fullest, skeleton key awoke, unlocked, danced with remembrances dead. Moonlight waned darkest, deepest, starlight glowed, 
Remembrances dead, revels ended. Skeleton key slept. Locked door again. Skeleton key found, memories passed. Then locked up, skeleton key lost. Thank you. I understand you a lot better now, now that I know about the wife whose second husband you became at 31, and whose two sons you made your own until one of them died of diabetes, and the other sucked your meager money dry. And while you earned a second retirement, she went and lost her memory, leaving you, only you to remember the inadequacy of recompense, because someone has to or there wasn't any point in working indoors all those years where the sun can't burn your neck red no matter how hot the Mississippi sun. and pear apricot then there